Welcome to Gracefully Graying. I am your host, divorce and family law attorney, Henry Gornbein. I am a senior partner in the law firm of Lippitt O'Keefe Gornbein, which is a full service law firm located here in Birmingham, Michigan. Gracefully Graying is going to be exploring issues that we all face as we grow older. Mm -hmm. The demographics are people who are 50 and over, and we will be discussing topics such as economic issues, retirement issues, medical and health issues, as well as legal issues that we all face as we go older or have aging parents. Today on Gracefully Grading, I would like to welcome as my guest, Reva Gornbein, who will be 98 in September, and has led a fascinating life. Reva, welcome to Gracefully Graying. Thank you. Reva, this past December, you went to Antarctica. So why did you go to Antarctica? Well, I've done a lot of travel. When my husband and I were, my husband was living, we would go together all over the world, and I've never been to Antarctica. And I thought my traveling days were over, but someone invited me, so I went in December. And what was so interesting is on the trip, the Chinese men wanted to have a picture with me. Well, they respect the elderly more right. than they do here. Right, and they said their wives wouldn't come on the trip. So they all took, and I happen to have a friend who's Chinese, and she goes back and forth, and she said she went back to China and saw my picture on TV. In China. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what were the highlights of the trip, and how rugged was it? Well, it, I went to the brochure, and the brochure says, rugged grandeur, and it really is. And when you're there, you're surrounded by icebergs that are all white and, and you just feel like you're in a different world. And then they said sublime serenity. And when you're there, you're on a zodiac cruising in the, on this river and it's so peaceful and the wind is blowing on your face. That's the, I love that the best part, although everything was nice, but I looked forward because you go twice a day on this trip to different islands. What did you see on the islands? Was there much wildlife? Right, there were penguins and uh, seals. And uh, I would like to mention, when I, when I heard about the trip, I had no idea what was involved. And I had to go to Miami, and from Miami I had to fly to San Diego, Chile. And from San Diego, Chile, I had to fly to Punta Arles. And from Punta Arles, I had to fly to King Arthur Island, and I'm still not on Antarctica. And when I got that, to that island, they were very helpful about my age. And one of the staff came up to me and said, in order to get to Antarctica, you have to walk about 15 minutes to the ship, and I will take you on my, I will drive you there. And he took me there, and what we came to was like an army tank. <laughs> and I thought, how am I going to get up there? And what I did is I put one foot on top of the tire, and I thought, how am I going to? And the next thing I know, he pushed me from the back gently, and I landed in the tank, in the tank. <laughs> and then we walked there, and then when we get to the ship, uh, it was, was the ship rugged? Was it a rugged trip? No, no. The, well, just walking there was easy. The ship was nice, very nice. And going to the, on the, cruising on the uh, Zodiac is great. And you get to the shore, and when I get to the shore, I had trouble, and I was afraid I would fall down. Sure. I didn't want to fall down, because my doctor had said to me, if you don't fall down, You'll live to a hundred, so I don't want to fall down. So one of the staff would pick me up <laughs> and put me on the shore, and it was all rocks. 
and you see all these little parade of penguins walking around there, and you don't disturb them, this is their island. You don't walk on their path, you don't feed them. They are there and everything is pristine. And when I got there, I was concerned about the rocks and one of the staff said, I will take you. And he went ahead and walked all around the island. It was great. Reba, you were in World War II. Why did you decide, you enlisted in the Army, is that correct? Right. Why did you decide to enlist in the Army? Well, you know, when I was in my 20s, I was working for attorneys and they were always traveling all over the world. And I had volunteered for the USO and I was playing. I was very patriotic and doing everything. And when the Army said, we will recruit women, I thought, and really, this is my chance to travel. And I made sure, and when I got in that service, I traveled all over. Where did you go? Well, first I went to every I tried to go when they, they would have a basketball team and I would join the basketball team and they would fly us with bombers <laughs> to another state and we would play with another team in another state. Then I took a class in uh, to be a sta to a drill sergeant, San Antonio, Texas. I went there. And then they called me into the office and they said, we want you to go to a cryptography class. And I went there and what it was, the computer doesn't come out till 46 and this was 44. And what I did is I had a keyboard, I had a desk, like a desktop, but instead of a ID and a password, you had to have a five digit code. And I learned to work on that. That's why the computer now is so different though, but it was a lot easier then. And when did you go overseas? Well, then Hitler died in April of 45. And Roosevelt died the same month. Yeah. And I remember they called me in and said, we want you to be in the Army of Occupation. And when I got overseas. First of all, where'd you fly to when you, you where'd you fly from? We, fly, we went to Norfolk, Norfolk, Virginia, and we went on ship. It took two weeks to go on a troop ship. Oh, and that's another thing. The troop ship, the troop ship had been a luxury liner, and it was converted to a troop ship. And if you can just imagine, there's like four or 5,000 men and about 30 women. And apparently this, when it was a luxury liner, there was a one section that was really segregated from all the rest. And it was like in a balcony away from everybody. And that's where they housed us 30 so women. So you were like in the first class basically. Right, except that they gutted everything. And I went on the, my first ocean voyage, in, ocean, ocean voyage was in a hammock. There were 30 hammocks <laughs> there in that room and that's how I got to Europe. <laughs> and where did you land? And I landed in La Havre and I told them, well that was, an, this is another history part. Hitler uh, had to, well in 1918 they surrendered, remember the World well, that War, was the surrender World War, World War I. One. Yes. They had a boxcar in Compiègne, France, and they had the generals come and sign total surrender. Well, then in 1945, when Hitler took over, he said, I remember he invaded France, and he said, you're coming and you're going to sign surrender. So he made the French come back to France in Compiègne. Well, then he lost the war. So now Eisenhower says, Americans are gonna go back. So that's where I landed in Compiègne, France in 1944. And then, and then when did you go to Germany? Well, and then I said to them, I wanna, if you go to Germany, you can stay there, but you can't, 
you can't travel there unless you're stationed in Germany. And I wanted to go to, I, I don't know, I had to see a concentration camp. So I asked the office if I could be stationed in Germany. So they stationed me in Berlin district. And you were in Berlin, weren't you? Berlin, right. How long were you in Berlin? I was in Berlin over a year. And did you see Hitler's bunker where he committed suicide? Yes. Tell and us about it. <laughs> and what they did was the people who lived in nice homes with big backyards would build a bunker in the backyard under a tree so that when a bomber would fly over, they wouldn't see, the, or they'd have a little like a dollhouse. And so when a bomber would come, they'd leave the home and then go in the backyard under the tree in the house or the bunker. And that's where his bunker was. You just walked, it was like, a, you walked down a few steps. It was all, uh, it was, it was concrete? Yeah, concrete, right, and a little cot and maybe some water. That's all I remember seeing there. But this is, you actually were in Hitler's bunker. Right, that's what they told us, it was Hitler's bunker, yeah. Was it large? No, it was very small. It was probably maybe 10 by 12, something like, yeah, very small. And it was just enough for a cot and maybe not even a chair. I don't even see a chair there. And this is where he had actually killed himself. Right, suppose, and yeah. I think his mistress, who he married at the end, was Eva Braun, and she had also committed suicide in the same bunker. Right, that's what I understand. And then you were sent on a mission, and I would like you t to tell us about this, but we're gonna s talk about this, we're gonna be breaking in a minute, so what I'd like to do is leave us with the fact that you were sent on a, a mission where you were escorting a, a very important prisoner. Right. And I'd like you to tell us about that as soon as we take a short break. Okay. And, uh, you know, we're going to go there, then we're going to talk about your visit to the concentration camp. Okay. As a business owner, you're always looking to save money and cut costs where you can. And if you advertise on radio or television, you know it can get pretty pricey. If radio and TV aren't delivering like they promised, and you're looking for a more reasonably priced way to get your message to the masses, I've got an answer for you. New Radio Media. With live streaming and on-demand programming, your message can be seen throughout the day, and you can worry a little less about cutting those costs. For more information, go to newradiomedia.com or call Buzz Van Houten at 248-939-9999. Plus, the latest LiftMaster garage door openers and the toughest retractable screens on the market, all by the push of a button. Tarno Doors is celebrating its 50th year anniversary and is the recipient of the 2016 Subcontractor of the Year from the Home Builders Association. Tarno knows doors. Tarno knows doors. Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm David. Join us for fun and adventure on our new show, PodQuesters, where we fight through imaginary battles and pray to the dice gods for good rolls. Yes, it's an epic sweeping adventure. We try to fulfill our destinies without driving the Dungeon Master crazy. I thought that was the point. Anyways, check us out here on NewRadioMedia.com Fridays, PodQuesters. See you there. Want to stay informed, entertained, and enlightened? Get connected and stay connected today to New Radio Media. The new Radio Media app is now available for download in the Apple and Google Play Store. Just search for NRM Streams for unlimited access to archived, live, new, exciting, and unique content. Welcome to Geektainment Weekly, all for free. Do it now. Stay connected. We are back with my guest, Reva Gornbein. Reva, at the break, you had told us about your experience uh, seeing the bunker where Hitler and Eva Braun had committed suicide. 
You told us earlier that you wanted to see a concentration camp. Yeah. Tell us about that experience. First of all, what camp did you go to and tell us about okay. it. Okay. Uh, I visited Dachau in Munich. And what happened when I was in Berlin, worked in the judge advocate section, the colonel, Colonel Emery, came to me and said, we need to bring one of the prisoners, Hitler's secretary, back to Berlin to be court martial. So I remember saying, oh, here's my chance to go to a concentration camp. And I said, I'll go. And he said, we can't send a woman. I said, why not? I'll go and trust me, I'll bring him back. That's just the way I was. Was determined. he in the concentration camp? He was in the con in Kakao. When I got there, it's a, like a permanent installation. It's all brick. Yeah, it's like a sulfurous field here. However, uh, there's like a woods, and in the woods, when you walk in the woods, there's a. It's like a brick building. Uh, not brick. It looks like a garage and it had three steps, and the steps were all worn out. And I, uh, the reason I had chance to go is when I was supposed to bring the prisoner back, they called me and said, uh, you can't take a, a civilian on a military aircraft. So if you want to go back with a prisoner, you have to go through the Russian zone. And I just pictured myself going through, I don't speak Russian, I know nothing about it, and they can take me off, and if he starts running, am I gonna chase him? <laughs> so for that reason, I had days there waiting for clearance to get on, a military, on an aircraft. And so I started exploring, and that's how come I found this field. And I went inside that crematory, and there are two ovens there. And in front of the oven are two pipes, real big pipes. And on the pipes are, is a tray. And apparently they just put the body on the tray and just push it in the oven. And while I was standing there, I was all alone, I heard a car drive up. And it's so devastating that I thought they were coming after me. That's how been ter terrifying. It was horrible. And actually, 25 years later, I went back to recover my steps. And you know, the building was cold, closed. I went back. I had to see it. There were no steps. And in front of the crematory was a big casket. And on top of it was a cross. And I took a picture of it. I couldn't believe it. So there was a car. Was the car there with the prisoner going back to the... Oh, well, see, when, we, when I had to go back, when they finally, Colonel called me, and he said, you can get clearance. So uh, I took the prisoner, and I was never alone with him. There was always a GI with me. And we got to this plane, we got on this plane, and it was a C-54, which is a cargo ship. <laughs> and there are no seats there, it's all the fuselage, you have just metal along the side within so What are you holding on to? You're holding well, on you to don't. There's no seat belt, nothing. You're just sitting there. And there, the place is full of GIs. And I'm coming in, the only female, and I have this man in civilian clothes next to me. <laughs> and we're sitting on the plane facing each other. And what was so strange is, Nobody said anything. It was so quiet, like, what am I going there? Maybe they thought it was my husband. I don't know. And, and we what was his position? Well, he was supposed to be Hitler's secretary. So he but was Hitler Hitler's had many secretaries. But was he one of Hitler's personal secretaries? That I don't know. I don't know. I never stayed for the trial or anything, so I didn't check all his. But all I knew is, I remember, I just looked at him and I said, Schweig, and I didn't want him to say anything. <laughs> and you know what? He never opened his mouth. <laughs> and when we got, to, we got to Nuremberg, and two big NPs get on the plane, and of course they see me and they come right up to me. And they said to me, you have to get off the plane. And I looked him in the eye and I said, 
there's no way I'm getting off this plane because I knew I'd have to go through the Russians. And you know what? They turned around and walked out. And we sat there for about two hours and apparently they called my colonel and he said, bring her home. And then we took off and we landed in Berlin and there was a staff car waiting for me and uh, a patrol car waiting for him. And then I was redeployed very soon after that. So I never did find out what happened with him. About three weeks ago, I called you <laughs> and you said you'd been at Beaumont Hospital and I got a little alarmed. Why were you at Beaumont Hospital three weeks ago? Well, I know I'm deteriorating. I know that. So I'm trying to get back like I used to be. And they have a course for balance. Because I said, the doctor said, don't, don't lose, don't fall down. So that was a six week course. And then they offered, so I took that. And then they have another course for mature drivers. And I took that. I'm taking everything. Maybe I can get back to how I was when I was 25. <laughs> well, I know you try. And how much do you walk every day? Well, when I don't, when it's real bad and I don't often walk often, I have a stationary bike at home and I go on there for at least an hour. I, in the, when I have to just start, I do it for a half hour and then I try to build up to an hour. And I have that. But when the weather is nice, where I walk, I can walk two miles and it's great. It's right on a nice, I don't walk on the street. I have to walk on a sidewalk and it, it's great. I love to walk outside and I walk for about two uh, miles as much as I can. You still play bridge and teach bridge. How often do you play bridge now? Well, I play socially. I've been teaching it when I retired. I started teaching bridge for 22 years and I just, re I just retired from bridge again. I retired from teaching and then I started over playing teaching again but this time it was bridge and you taught where did you teach when you taught pardon where did I in no not bridge as a school teacher you oh were in Clawson I taught in Clawson I taught for yeah and what did you teach I taught first I taught um, just a, a great grade school and then I went and bad to get my masters and I wanted to teach remedial and that's a different section altogether yeah and you got your master's. Right, and I got it at Wayne, yeah. When you teach bridge, you're still doing it, it's on a, is it as a volunteer when you go to the, for lack of a better word, the retirement facilities? Or no, no. <laughs> you're paid. I feel, right, I worked hard to get those degrees, and I know I'm a good teacher. I really, I'm a better teacher than I am a player. And when I work, I get paid. I want to get paid, yeah, or I don't do it. So you're still paid. Right. So I'm you're not fully retired yet. No, no. Do you ever want to retire? I want to keep, I'm still reading books and trying to learn to play better. I'm not a very, I'm not an expert player like a lot of people are. I'm just average. And I, I'm hoping someday maybe I'll get better. <laughs> do you ever play for master points? Well. I never cared about the points. That was not my problem. But then last year, when I, I go to visit my children, and they had a tournament, and this friend said to me, you know, if you go to the tournament, you'll have to pay more money because you're not a member, so just join. So I joined, and that was last year after playing all these years. So. I don't really care about the points, but I, now I get points because I'm, and they keep uh, telling me I'm a master. I'm not. <laughs> but you're, you stay active in many ways. I mean, you go to movies, you right. go out to dinner, you see friends. What are, would you recommend to someone, you know, who's in their 80s or 90s? As to how do you stay fit? How do you? How do you keep young? How do you have your, the zest that you have, which is a rare quality? Well, when someone invites me, I go. I go. And I like to experience different things. And I maybe, 
because I was a third child, by the time I, my sister was four, my brother was two, and I was born. So my mother really didn't have much time for me because she had a lot of other problems besides taking care of the house. So I found that I could do anything I wanted, and if I make a mistake, I don't care. No big deal. So I try, and I don't want, I want, I treasure my independence. So my children think I'm perfect because I have no problems, because I never tell them anything that has I know, we have to pry things out of you. <laughs> right. <laughs> you can be difficult about that. You still drive at night, don't you? Oh, yes, right. And you drive everywhere. And I drive everywhere, right. And I remember it was about three years ago, you came home from wintering in North Carolina, and you told me that you wanted to buy a new car. Right. And you decided you wanted to buy an SUV. Right. And you enjoy driving the SUV. I love it because it has all the safety features, and that's very important to me. And I know many times when I back up, I think I would have hit somebody, but then you go ding, 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 and the minute I hear that, I stop, and I wait, and then of course I have it in front of me too, and I watch when someone walks. So I wouldn't give up that car with the safety features for anything. Well, down to a little over a minute. Reva, what advice would you give to our viewers as to how to stay young and active at almost 98? Well, I, three things. Number one, you have to have your health. You have to keep active and have your health and eat well. Food is crucial. Second, you need the money. You don't want to have to ask your children for money. You want to be independent. So if you have your own money, you don't have to depend on them to do what you want. And number three, you really need friends. And if you maintain friendships with others, you got it made. And you do all of that, and you do it well, and we're out of time, so Reva Gornbein, I want to thank you so much for being my guest on Gracefully Graying, and I don't want to watch, thank our viewers for watching Gracefully Graying. What's going on in your neighborhood? They say it takes a village. It's the simple things. The things that are a testament to the old. And the things that are a testament to the new. Know what's going on in your community. Check out our community channel on newradiomedia.com. Why are we here? What makes a person truly good? For those answers, you're gonna have to take a philosophy class. But if you're more interested in who would win in a fight between R2-D2 and a Dalek, watch Get It to the Geeks on Tuesdays at 6 p.m. on newradiomedia.com. This June, Fat Mike's Punk and Drublick Festival takes over Legend Valley Campground in Thornville, Ohio for three days of kick-ass punk rock, food, beer, and camping. Lineup includes No Effects, Rancid, Me First and the Gimme Gimmies, Pennywise, Money Money Boss Jones, and much, much more. In addition, there will be a craft beer tasting garden with over 200 craft beers, which includes local and national. Also, there will be stories from the road, including Fat Mike of No Effects, Keith Morris of Black Flag, and Jello Biafra. Tickets are on sale right now at punkandrublicfest.com. We'll see you there. Take it out,